Um, so my name is Iqbal, and um, like many of you, I'm sure you've probably come from different backgrounds and uh, had before you've ended up in these careers. So in my past, I, I started off as a designer, um, realized I wasn't very good at making things look nice. Um, so then went into UX, um, so that's kind of much more evidence-based. So you're basically making, you're, you're basically designing something to uh, perform a function. Um, and then that kind of led me into development and finally um, experimentation, um, which is what I've been doing for the past so sort of 10 or so years. Um, across all of that, I've also been creating comics, um, which is really quite relevant because as my graphic design lecturer used to always tell me, um, design is about communication. So it doesn't matter if you're, you're creating uh, or you're trying to communicate a value proposition or you're trying to communicate a story through some comic panels. It's all about communication. So why should you care about this stuff? Well, one thing is you can get on better with the designers, um, knowing, their, knowing how to communicate with them, uh, with their language. Um, and also, the other thing is, I really believe this, everyone is a designer at some point or stage in their life, because you'd, you'd, you'd have to communicate, if you've ever communicated with PowerPoint presentations, um, graphs or whatever, um, you've been um, doing uh, design um, sort of um, stuff. Um, and the other thing is, um, it helps with experiment ideation. So, um, because UX is kind of like this, this merging of the computer and human interaction. So understanding that is actually key to a lot of, a lot of what experimentation uh, is about. Um, so what I'm going to present here are gonna be uh, four practical tips, hacks, that you can hopefully take away and put to use um, straight away. Um, there's gonna be one uh, design uh, specific one, two UX specific ones, and one which is a comic specific one. Uh, something I've learned from um, creating comics. Um, so the first one is 60-30-10 rule. Um, first of all, has anyone heard of this rule? Cool, I think there's a couple of nods. So before, um, before I go into what the 60-30-10 rule is, um, just want to go through two UX laws that are quite important to know. Uh, one which is Hicks law, which says time it takes to make a decision increases with the number and complexity of choices. That basically means something like this, low number of choices for the user, what the user should be doing on the site, um, low cognitive load, and something like Yahoo, lots of stuff on the site, lots of um, stimuli, uh, high cognitive load. I'm not making any value judgments on each either of those because these are two very different companies, uh, but it's something um, important to kind of take away. Um, the second effect is kind of like the, the von Restorff effect, which basically states that when multiple similar objects are present, the one that differs is the one that's most likely to be remembered. Basically, different stands up. <clears throat> so, 60-30-10 rule. That basically says, if you've got three, you basically pick three main colors. And with those picking the colors, you don't have to pick, you don't have to use those colors exactly, you can use different values, different shades of that color. Uh, but you basically have 60, um, one color that takes up 60% of the screen, another color uh, that takes up 30, another that takes up 10. So here's, here's um, one example of that in use. So when you're uh, dressing up in a suit, uh, the eye is drawn to the tie. Um, here is a comic example. So the eye is drawn to the Hellboy character is the red. And this is um, painting uh, by Claude Monet. So you can see here that the red is really drawing the eye. So here is a, a way that I like to use it. Uh, for the 60% of the color, uh, pick a monochromatic color, white, gray, or something light blue, um, and then pick your two sort of colors to sort of complement that. So you can see here on the color wheel, um, taking Claude Monet's. So you've got the 60%, which is the green, the blue, which is next to that, and then the red, which is opposite the blue. So how do you use that? So you can, if you're doing presentations, you can 
draw the people's attention to a bad period of data, for example. Um, if you're doing websites, you can use that so people don't miss the uh, primary CTAs. So um, it's important to use the 60 30 10 rule to help users focus on specific stuff um, that you want them to. Um, so the next thing is um, considered versus non considered purchases. So this comes, has anyone heard of this one? Cool. So this one comes, um, I learned this one from Joe Leach, a good friend of mine. Um, basically, it says that when, you, when you're buying something, for example, a car versus books, um, they're two very different products. So for a car, it's a very high considered um, consideration phase. So it has a high decision-making time. Um, you're, you're really focused on the quality. You're probably going to want to take out something long-term service or a contract afterwards. Non-considered, you're not too um, sort of fussed. It's kind of like a very low decision-making time. Um, your price is probably important, and you're probably worried about shipping speed, getting it as quickly as possible. So how do you determine whether or not your product is a considered or non-considered product? Well, here's are some, um, some tips. So if you see people making multiple visits uh, before purchasing, that's usually a considered product. Um, they, if they're going away, doing some research, getting some second opinions, that's also a sign of a consideration, uh, a considered product. A non-considered product, so if you see fewer visits and if you see higher mobile conversions, so if your mobile conversions are higher than desktop conversions, that's probably a sign that it's a non-considered um, product. And also if people are really focused on those shipping details, that's a sign that it's also a non-considered product. These things are probably going to be uh, sort of uh, bound to change a little bit. They are kind of shifting a little bit as people's um, sort of uh, uh, browsing habits change. Uh, but I've seen that in a lot of sites as well. So optimizing considered versus non-considered is going to look very different. Um, considered, like you say, you've got this really long lead time. So you've got things like, uh, you, you want to do things like save for later, email newsletter. So when they're going away, you can draw them back in. Um, also, they'd really, uh, what they'd be really interested in is a multiple book and booking step flow. So you want to really, um, so when you really handhold them through the entire process, make sure that they're getting the right product that they need. Um, with a non-considered product, um, people will be reviews, price comparisons, uh, fewer steps, all of those things work. Um, so, um, so those are things that you can do to, to kind of optimize the site from that, side of that perspective. So this is a quick one, um, aesthetic usability effect. So this is basically something that happens when you're doing user tests. So when you're doing user tests, people often conflate what looks nice to what is actually usable, even though that's, that may not be the case. So for instance, if they have uh, an option between some uh, product that's really functional or design that's really functional and something that looks nice, users will be drawn to the thing that looks nice. And they will say that that is actually really usable. This is something I see a lot of the time, um, especially if I'm recording user tests. Uh, the user test goes out to the entire company. That kind of causes a little bit of a problem. So something to, uh, to really look out for. Um, and just so, so basically, don't trust what people say. Trust what people do. Um, and also beware of your own biases. So finally, this is the comic-related one. Um, so show and tell. This is all about subtext. So show and tell is a very uh, popular rule with storytelling. So for that, let's go through an example. Say we want to communicate the fact that we have a main character. Um, the dad was an alcoholic. He didn't get along with his dad. And the guy's dead. This is one way to say this. We can just basically have the character say all of this information. Um, so this kind of ticks all the boxes. Um, it communicates all of those three things. But it's not really very memorable. It's very exposition heavy. So this is, this is the, um, the idea of a tell. So basically, when you're telling something, you're, you're just basically blurting that information out. The, the, the user is just basically 
absorbing that information, not really doing anything uh, behind the scenes, behind the in behind the heads. This is an alternative one. So the guy goes to the cemetery, bottle of vodka, pours the vodka on the grave, throws a bottle, walks away. This also communicates those same three things, but the information is in the subtext. It's implied. So if you go back, you see that it's not actually, there's not actually anything there that says he's an alcoholic, says that he's dead, says that he doesn't get along, but all of that is implied in the actions. So this is all about um, communicating through subtext. And what that does is what you're doing is you're basically giving people some pieces of a very easy puzzle to put together in their heads. And this is something that, um, that makes the information really memorable. So this is from a film called Gross Point Blank, um, which is a good film, recommend you watch it. Um, it's, the key thing is, is that I watched this film a long time ago, but I still remember that scene. So let's make this relevant. Now let's say we want to communicate um, something with our users. So in a company that I work for, we ran some user tests and we determined that some users had some concerns. They wanted to know, is this really the best price? And they wanted to know, why buy from here instead of elsewhere? And this is a uh, version of that website. Um, so as you can see, there was a value proposition section at the top. So we ran a lot of tests on this value proposition. I uh, tried a lot of mis different messaging, a lot of different visuals, nothing worked. But one thing we noticed is, you see at the bottom there, where there's like three products. There's a product with a price and a saving. Um, what we realized is that changing those actually made that impact, actually was a conversion lever. And what was more important or interesting is after we made those changes, and that was way on the homepage, what we found out is that it actually, nothing happened in between all of those steps, and there's actually more steps uh, than this even, but the real impact was felt at the end. So it's this, this idea of, of communicating um, via demonstrating the value proposition, rather than just kind of like telling them, hey, we do really good price deals. Um, actually demonstrating the fact that we do price deals was actually, had a really lasting effect. So basically that sort of, um, that sort of information lasted all the way through the booking flow onto the final purchase. So just to, just to finish off then, um, there's lots of different ways to communicate. Um, and that's, that's the key thing that we really need to take away. The fact that you can just communicate via tell, but there's also other options you can do. Cool, thank you.